Okay, so uh, Monday morning, and we're starting off with two very quick fire lightning openers to get the initial thoughts rolling. Um, and our first speaker is Andy Bounds, who is a sales expert and also a best selling author on the subject. He's, um, he's worked with many, many of the largest law firms. He's worked with other sectors too, though, so he brings best practices from other areas, uh, which is something that's very much um, in the briefing mold. Um, he's also voted Britain's Sales Trainer of the Year. Um, and some of his books include um, Top Dog, Impressive Influence, Everyone You Meet, um, which is something I, I certainly want to know a bit more about. I know. Uh, he also tells us that um, his mother is blind, which he says has given him a lifetime's experience of communicating with somebody who can't see him. Um, it's over to you, Andy. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, and hello, everyone. Nice to meet you all today. So I've gone for the, I think, very clever title of Virtually Brilliant. Um, so how can we be brilliant in this virtual world? And by brilliant, I mean, look at the subheading, create and maintain strong relationships in a remote world. As you heard in the introduction, one of the reasons I know quite a bit about this is to do with my mum, who's blind. So I'm very used to talking to people who can't see me. Now, that is very important from a sales point of view and a business relationship point of view, but it's even more important in a lockdown when we can't see anybody anyway. So what I want to show you in the next five, six, seven minutes is three very simple steps to being virtually brilliant. And might I suggest the first thing that you and your um, uh, companies do not do is what people tend to do, which looks remarkably like this next slide. You may recognize things like this, either from your sales presentations or from your proposals um, or from your credentials slides or whatever it might be. The general rule is if you want to impress people, you have to say things they find impressive. And I've yet to find anyone who's looked at me and said, really, you were founded in 1922, 94 offices. Please hope to heavens the next slide is a map of all of them. Um, let's have a look at this. One of the main differentiators we have is our strong technical expertise. Well, I'd expect you to be a technical expert because of what your job is. So this is how many people, including your competitors, sell and communicate. It's absolutely not best practice. It's just very common practice. So what should we do instead? I said there are three steps to follow. These are the three steps. The first thing you need is the right mindset. If we're going to develop really good relationships with people who can't see us, we need to think a certain way. And most people don't do this. I'm going to show you what that is. Then we need to actually have value adding conversations with them. And then finally, we need to do things that enhance the relationship. Now, if you're looking from a sales point of view, how you win the sale. If you're looking from a relationship point of view, how you enhance the relationship. They're the only three things you need to get good at. I'm going to spend a minute or two on each and then I'm out of here and I'll let you get on with, your, with the rest of your day with all your peas. So let's have a look at right mindset. And for right mindset, we really need to be able to answer the most important questions in a relationship development and in selling and in BD and all that stuff. I'm going to ask you this question in a second, and I'm going to ask you please to write down. So humor me. Let's make it nice and interactive. Write down your answer to this on a piece of paper um, uh, on, on some notes. So don't go in the chat box. Nobody will want to share this. Uh, you'll see in a minute why. So if I could ask you please to, you've got 10 seconds to answer this question. What? What do you think is your firm's best selling point? Okay, thank you. And now, please, could I ask you to write down underneath it, what do you think is your personal best selling point? <laughs> this is why you don't want to be typing it in the chat box. I think I'm very humorous. So you should have a selling point for your firm and underneath what you think your best selling point is. I'll give you another five seconds. Now, what we'll do is we'll look at it from a firm point of view and then we'll have a look at it from your point of view. Generally, when I work with organizations and I ask them to talk about their selling point, they go for what I call the type one selling point. And the way to explain this is this, the top, one is you. So a little market stall, you're selling yourself or your firm, you're selling it to me, the client. So I've got my little uh, shopping basket. Um, and I'm going to put a timeline on here. So imagine we're talking now. So we're in the center point of this slide. Now, most people, when they talk about selling points, go top left. This is type one. 
So if you have a look at what you wrote to start with, when I said what's your firm's main selling point, have a look what you wrote. Were you talking about your firm and were you talking about the past? So, for example, if you were saying um, our client list, our cutting edge legal expertise, our history, our heritage, our value, our customer service, our product range, um, our sector expertise, blah, 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 blah. That's type one. That's what virtually all law firms do when I ask this question. So if you've done that, you're the same as everybody else. And that's fine, but it's the same as everybody else. And it's not just in the legal sector. It's in every sector. Most people go top left. And have a look what you wrote about yourself. When I said, what's your best selling point? People often talk about themselves and their past. So uh, I'm very diligent. I work hard. I'm good at building relationships. I'm good at selling. And so it all starts with I or we. Type two selling point is the entire opposite. It's bottom right. So instead of talking about you, it talks about me. And instead of talking about the past, it talks about the future. So when I said, what's your company's best selling point? Have a look what you wrote. Did you say, Andy, my best selling point is I can make you more successful in the future. I can keep you out of jail. I can help you get the property transaction. I can save you money. I can reduce your fines. Because the weird thing is, no customer really ultimately cares about the type one selling point. They're interested in the type two one. And you're exactly the same. Are you interested in me because of my past? I've won awards. I've written books. I've got a blind mum. Or are you interested in me because after hearing this, you hopefully are going to build better relationships and impress and influence everyone when you can't see them anymore? So put very simply, the biggest mistake people make when they're building relationships and they're selling is they talk about themselves and their past too much. And here's the thing. Other stakeholders don't care why you say you're great. They care about why you can make them great. So when people ask me for my best selling point, I always say, well, I hope you can sell. I help you sell more. I might tweak it a bit now. I can help you sell more in a lockdown. I might tweak it even more. I help you sell more in a lockdown when you can't meet with your clients face to face. Now, that sounds quite compelling. If I say I'm a consultant, you'll probably say between jobs, are you? So I can boil all this down into one word. And the key word when you're building relationships is the word afters. People don't care about you. They care why they're better off after you. Yep, I don't want a lawyer. I just don't want to go to jail. I don't want an accountant. I just don't want to pay as much tax, hopefully legally, or I'll need a lawyer again. Nobody wants me. They just want to sell more. And so the thing from your firm's point of view, they don't want your firm. They want why they're better off after your firm. And here's the thing. Your stakeholders want why they're better off after you. So as far as mindset goes, think afters. As far as building relationships goes, there's only two things that matter here. Unfortunately, they both rhyme. So to build relationships, it's much easier when people know us. So we speak with them often enough. And also they owe us because of the value we give them. Now, I know this is all really obvious, but let me ask you this question. Think of your most important stakeholders, your most important internal colleagues, your most important external stakeholders, introducers, clients, whoever it might be. When do you tend to ring them? When do you tend to get in contact? Because in my experience, people tend to get in contact either when they personally want something or when there's an exterior trigger. There's a lockdown. I better ring you up. But when you think about it, the, most, the best relationships are the ones where there's proactive contact. So we speak with them. We don't need a trigger. We don't need a desire to make more sales. We don't need a, oh, I better keep in contact. What we need is proactive client engagement. So I have a very simple exercise I do with all my customers. And I suggest that you do this with your colleagues as well and do it yourself. Who are your five most important contacts? And what you do is you do a little three column table. You list in the left hand column your five most important contacts. In the middle column, you think, do I speak with them often enough? Do they know me? The purple, do they know me often enough? So, for example, contact number one, let's say she's called Julie. You really ought to speak to her every week. So in the middle column, you think I need to speak to her weekly. The next person is somebody called Janice. where you only need to speak to Janice every month. So in the middle column, you think how often should they hear from me every week, every month, every quarter, every day? What is it? So the middle column, all, every word that goes in there ends with L-Y, weekly, daily, monthly. 
And then, this is so simple, this, you group all the weeklies together. So I have four people I need to speak to every week. So get this, in my calendar, so my Outlook diary, I have a weekly diary entry which says, speak to my weeklies. And when, I, when it comes up, I've got a little half hour booked in and I contact all my weeklies. And I have a monthly recurring diary entry for my monthlies and a quarterly recurring diary entry for my quarterlies. And that means I get to speak to people the right number of times. I don't need an external trigger to speak to my most important stakeholders. I know it sounds really obvious this, but do you do it? Do your lawyers do it? Or do they wait for a trigger before they contact? I used to have a bank manager, you'll see why it's used to in a minute. And he used to ring me every time he had a new product to sell me. So I never heard from him ever, ever, unless there was a new product to sell me. And I used to hate him because it got to the point when I looked at the phone, I saw him ring and I thought, here comes the sale. All right. So don't wait for the trigger. Proactively contact. Use your diary to remind you. And when you do contact them, make sure you give them something of value so they feel in your debt. I mean, basic rule of influencing, people have this sense of reciprocity. Give to them, they want to give back to you. So imagine if you and all your colleagues proactively spoke to all your contacts often enough, and every time you did, you gave them something of value. You taught them something, you introduced them to someone useful, you invited them to an event, you gave them a thought leadership piece, you gave them some advice to save them some time. Really easy. You just need to do this little three column table, bang it in the diary, off and running. I know it sounds common sense. In fact, I was talking to a group recently about this who did the same job as you in a different sector. And I said, go to the chat box. So you don't need to do this now because we're really short of time. Go to the chat box and tell me if you think you're above average for doing this. Because it's so obvious. I just want you to tell me if you're above average, you're average or you're below average. And we had 173 people on the call. 171 of them told me they were above average. <laughs> well, that doesn't work, does it? Because half of them are worse than average because that's what an average is. This is one of these things you look at and think it is so obvious. I am bound to be above average at it. Well, half of us aren't. So what we've said so far is if we want to build better relationships, we need the right mindset. Our job is to think in terms of afters. We wrote down selling points before that talked about us and our past. No, think about them and their future. And then when we're thinking about them, we make sure that we speak with them often enough and we make sure we always add some value them when we do. Finally, it's a question of using the right words. And in my experience, if you use the right words, it's always easy to build relationships. Here we go, super quick. It's just to do with ABC. First thing we focus on is their afters. Ask good questions, find their priorities. Here's a good question for you. What are your priorities during the second lockdown? What do you need to get complete before the end of the year? What's the biggest challenge you're facing? Because you can't meet people face to face. If I could just give you one thing that would help you, what would it be? All these things find out what's important to the other person. Then you just build a bit of certainty. You help them. You give them something they find useful. And then finally, you close it off by agreeing next steps. And whether you're selling, whether you're building relationships, this is the order you should always do. If you want some homework, have a look at the most recent proposal your company sent or RFP, whatever you call it. It should be written in the order ABC. So it should start by saying, you've told us you have these three priorities, bang, bang, bang. Our firm can help you because, bang, bang, bang. So to go forward, here's how we do the next steps, bang, bang, bang. How often do we see that? Or how often do we see the proposal basically looks a little bit like this. Now, of course, if you get all these things right, ladies and gents, what we find is we are indeed thinking in terms of afters. We're having the right number of contact with the right amount of value with the right people. And then we always do the right words, the ABC. We find the afters, we build certainty, and we close it off to get next steps. I was only given 10 minutes today, so I hope you found this really helpful. If you want to ask me any questions about it, my email address is at the bottom. If you want more free advice off me, I post off on LinkedIn literally every day. Um, if you want to get my weekly tips, you're very welcome to those as well. Just drop me an email, put the word tips in the title. Don't even be polite. Just say tips and we'll sign you up and you'll get some free advice every week. I love you all. Thank you very much. And I'll hand back to our lovely host for the day.